And after a little pause, she said, I will call forth two or three more of the family. So she ran to the door and called out Prudence, Piety and Charity, who after a little more discourse with him, had him into the family and many of them meeting him at the threshold of the house said, Come in now, blessed of the Lord. This house was built by the Lord of the hill on purpose to entertain such pilgrims in. Then he bowed his head and followed them into the house. So when he was come in and set down, they gave him something to drink and consented together that until supper was ready, some of them should have some particular discourse with Christian for the best improvement of time. And they appointed piety and prudence and charity to discourse with him. And thus they began. Come, good Christian, since we have been so loving to you to receive you into our house this night, let us, if perhaps we may better ourselves thereby, talk with you of all things that have happened to you in your pilgrimage. With a very good will, and I am glad that you are so well disposed. What moved you at first to betake yourself to a pilgrim's life? I was driven out of my native country by a dreadful sound that was in my ears, to wit, that unavoidable destruction did attend me if I abode in that place where I was. But how did it happen that you came out of your country this way? It was as God would have it, for when I was under the fears of destruction, I did not know whither to go. But by chance there came a man, even to me, as I was trembling and weeping, whose name is Evangelist. And he directed me to the wicket gate, which else I should never have found, and so set me into the way that hath led me directly to this house. But did you not come by the house of the interpreter? Yes, and did see such things there, the remembrance of which will stick by me as long as I live. Especially three things to wit, how Christ, in despite of Satan, maintains his work of grace in the heart. How the man had sinned himself quite out of the hopes of God's mercy, and also the dream of him that thought in his sleep the day of judgment was come. Why? Did you hear him tell his dream? Yes, and a dreadful one it was, I thought. It, it made my heart ache as he was telling of it, but yet I am glad I heard it. Was that all you saw at the house of the interpreter? No, he took me and had me where he showed me a stately palace, and how the people were clad in gold that were in it, and how there came a venturous man and cut his way through the armed men that stood in the door to keep him out and how he was bid to come in and win eternal life. Methought those things did ravish my heart. I could have stayed at that good man's house a twelve-month, but that I knew I had further to go. And what saw you else in the way? Saw? Why, I went but a little further, and I saw one, as I thought in my mind, hang bleeding upon a tree, and the very sight of him made my burden fall off my back, for I groaned under a weary burden. But then it fell down from off me. T'was a strange thing to me, for I never saw such a thing before. Yea, and while I stood looking up, for then I could not forbear looking, three shining ones came to me. One of them testified that my sins were forgiven me. Another stripped me of my rags, and gave me this broidered coat which you see, and the third set the mark which you see in my forehead, and gave me this sealed roll. And with that he plucked it out of his bosom. But you saw more than this, did you not? The things that I have told you were the best, yet some other small matters I saw. As namely I saw three men, simple, sloth, and presumption, lay asleep a little out of the way as I came, with irons upon the hills. But do you think I could awake them? I also saw formality and hypocrisy come tumbling over the wall, to go, as they pretended, to Zion. But they were quickly lost, even as I myself did tell them, but they would not believe. But above all, I found it hard work to get up this hill, and as hard to come by the lion's mouse. And truly, if it had not been for the good man, the porter, that stands at the gate, I do not know, but that after all, I might have gone back again. But now I thank God I am here, and I thank you for receiving of me. Then Prudence thought good to ask him a few questions, and desired his answer to them. Do you not think sometimes of the country from whence you came? 
yea, but with much shame and detestation. Truly, if I had been mindful of that country from whence I came out, I might have had opportunity to have returned, but now I desire a better country that is heavenly. Do you not yet bear away with you some of the things that then you were conversant with all? Yes, but greatly against my will, especially my inward and carnal cogitations, with which all my countrymen, as well as myself, were delighted. But now all those things are my grief, and might I but choose mine own things. I would choose never to think of those things more. But when I would be doing of that which is best, that which is worst is with me. Do you not find sometimes as if those things were vanquished, which at other times are your perplexity? Yes, but that is but seldom. But they are to me golden hours in which such things happen to me. Can you remember by what means you find your annoyances at times as if they were vanquished? Yes, when I think what I saw at the cross, that will do it. And when I look upon my embroidered coat, that will do it. Also when I look into the roll that I carry in my bosom, that will do it. And when my thoughts wax warm about whither I am going, that will do it. And what is it that makes you so desirous to go to Mount Zion? Why, there I hope to see him alive that did hang dead on the cross. And there I hope to be rid of all those things that to this day are in me an annoyance to me. There they say there is no death, and there I shall dwell with such company as I like best. For, to tell you truth, I love him, because I was by him eased of my burden, and I am weary of my inward sickness. I would fain be where I shall die no more, and with a company that shall continually cry, Holy, holy, holy. Then said Charity to Christian, Have you a family? Are you a married man? I have a wife and four small children. And why did you not bring them along with you? Then Christian wept and said, Oh, how willingly would I have done it. But they were all of them utterly averse to my going on pilgrimage. But you should have taught them and have endeavoured to have shown them the danger of being behind. So I did, and told them also what God had showed to me of the destruction of our city. But I seemed to them as one that mocked, and they believed me not. And did you pray to God that he would bless your counsel to them? Yes, and that with much affection, for you must think that my wife and poor children were very dear unto me. But did you tell them of your own sorrow and fear of destruction? For I suppose that destruction was visible enough to you. Yes, over and over and over. They might also see my fears in my countenance, in my tears, and also in my trembling under the apprehension of the judgment that did hang over our heads. But all was not sufficient to prevail with them to come with me. But what could they say for themselves why they came not? Why my wife was afraid of losing this world, and my children were given to the foolish delights of youth. So what by one thing and what by another, they left me to wander in this manner alone. But did you not with your vain life damp all that you by words use by way of persuasion to bring them away with you? Indeed, I cannot commend my life, for I am conscious to myself of many failings therein. I know also that a man by his conversation may soon overthrow what by argument or persuasion he doth labour to fasten upon others for their good. Yet this I can say, I was very wary of giving them occasion by any unseemly action to make them averse to going on pilgrimage. Yea, for this very thing they would tell me I was too precise, and that I denied myself of things for their sakes, in which they saw no evil. Nay, I think I may say that if what they saw in me did hinder them, it was my great tenderness in sinning against God, or of doing any wrong to my neighbour. Indeed, Cain hated his brother, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. And if thy wife and children have been offended with thee for this, they thereby show themselves to be implacable to good, and thou hast delivered thy soul from their blood. 
Now I saw in my dream that thus they were sat talking together until supper was ready. So when they had made ready, they sat down to meat. Now the table was furnished with fat things, and with wine that was well refined. And all their talk at the table was about the Lord of the hill, as namely about what he had done, and wherefore he did what he did, and why he had built that house, and by what they said. I perceived that he had been a great warrior, and had fought with and slain him that had the power of death, but not without great danger to himself, which made me love him the more. For, as they said, and as I believe, said Christian, he did it with the loss of much blood, but that which put glory of grace into all he did was that he did it of a pure love to his country, and besides, there were some of them of the household that said they had seen and spoke with him since he did die on the cross, and they have attested that they had it from his own lips that he is such a lover of poor pilgrims, that the like is not to be found from east to the west. They moreover gave an instance of what they affirmed, and that was, he had stripped himself of his glory, that he might do this for the poor, and that they heard him say and affirm that he would not dwell in the mountain of Zion alone. They said, moreover, that he had made many pilgrims princes, though by nature they were beggars born, and their original had been the dunghill. Thus they discovered together till late at night, and after they had committed themselves to the Lord for protection, they betook themselves to rest. The pilgrim they laid in a large upper chamber, whose window opened towards the sun rising, the name of the chamber was Peace, where he slept till break of day, and then he awoke and sang. Where am I now? Is this the love and care of Jesus for the men that pilgrims are, thus to provide that I should be forgiven and dwell already the next door to heaven? So in the morning they all got up, and after some more discourse, they told him that he should not depart till they had showed him the rarities of that place. And first they had him into the study, where they showed him records of the greatest antiquity, in which, as I remember my dream, they showed him first the pedigree of the Lord of the Hill, that he was the son of the Ancient of Days, and came by an eternal generation. Here also was more fully recorded the acts that he had done, and the names of many hundreds that he had taken into his service, and how he had placed him in such habitations that he could neither by length of days nor decays of nature be dissolved. Then they read to him some of the worthy acts that some of his servants had done, as how they had subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned to flight, the armies of the aliens. Then they read again in another part of the records of the house, where it was showed how willing their Lord was to receive into his favour any, even any, though they in time past had offered great affronts to his person and proceedings. Here also were several other histories of many other famous things, all of which Christian had a view, as of things both ancient and modern together with prophecies and predictions of things that have their certain accomplishment, both to the dread and amazement of enemies, and the comfort and solace of pilgrims. The next day they took him and had him into the armory, where they showed him all manner of furniture, which their Lord had provided for pilgrims, as sword, shield, helmet, breastplate, all prayer, and shoes that would not wear out, and there was he enough of this to harness out as many men for the service of their Lord, as there be stars in the heaven for multitude. They also showed him some of the engines, with which some of his servants had done wonderful things. They showed him Moses' rod, the hammer and nail, with which Jael slew Sisera, the pitchers, trumpets and lamps too, with which Gideon put to flight the armies of Midian, then they showed him the ox's goad, wherewith Shamgar slew six hundred men. They showed him also the jawbone, with which Samson did such mighty feats. Then they showed him, moreover, the sling 
and stone with which David slew Goliath of Gath, and the sword also with which their Lord will kill the man of sin in the day that he shall rise up to the prey. They showed him besides many excellent things, with which Christian was much delighted. This done, they went to their rest again. Then I saw in my dream that on the morrow he got up to go forwards, but they also desired him to stay till the next day also. And then said they, We will, if the day be clear, show you the delectable mountains, which they said would yet farther add to his comfort, because they were nearer the desired heaven than the place where at present he was. So he consented and stayed. When the morning was up, they had him to the top of the house, and bid him look south. So he did, and behold, at a great distance, he saw a most pleasant mountainous country, beautified with woods, vineyards, fruits of all sorts, flowers also with springs and fountains, very delectable to behold. Then he asked the name of the country. They said it was Emmanuel's land, and it is as common, said they, as this hill is, to and for all the pilgrims. And when thou comest here from thence, thou mayst see to the gate of the celestial city, as the shepherds that live there will make appear. Now he bethought himself of setting forward, and they were willing he should. But first, said they, let us go again into the armory. So they did, and when he came there, they harnessed him from head to foot, with what was of proof, lest perhaps he should meet with assaults in the way. He being thus accoutred, walketh out with his friends to the gate, and there he asked the porter if he saw any pilgrim pass by. Then the porter answered, Yes. Pray, did you know him? said he. I asked his name, and he told me it was faithful. Oh, said Christian, I know him. He is my townsman, my dear neighbour. He comes from the place where I was born. How far do you think he may be before? He has got by this time below the hill. Well, said Christian, good porter, the Lord be with thee, and add to all thy blessings much increase for the kindness that thou hast showed to me. Then he began to go forward, but discretion, piety, charity, and prudence would accompany him down the foot of the hill. So they went on together, reiterating their former discourses, till they came to go down the hill. Then said Christian, as it was difficult coming up, so, so far as I can see, it is dangerous going down. Yes, said Prudence, so it is, for it is a hard matter for a man to go down into the valley of humiliation, as thou art now, and to catch no slip by the way. Therefore, said they, are we come out to accompany thee down the hill. So he began to go down, but very warily, yet he caught a slip or two. Then I saw in my dream that these good companions, when Christian was got down to the bottom of the hill, gave him a loaf of bread, a bottle of wine, and a cluster of raisins, and then he went his way. The pastoral emphasis of Bunyan's much-loved book comes to the fore in this next part of the story. It brings us to the house beautiful, occupied by four damsels or virgins, names discretion, prudence, piety, and charity. In the New Testament especially, we read of how God speaks of his body of Christ, his church as being the bride of Christ, and elsewhere, especially in their glorified form, undefiled virgins who follow the Lamb. Undoubtedly, Bunyan has this in mind as he brings the reader to this house, a house which depicts the local church and these virgins, the key graces and virtues which will manifest themselves in God's people. The importance of the local church and public fellowship is here seen. As Christian makes his way to this house, he notices that some have turned back beforehand, namely distrust and timorous. The chained lions which were in the way were certainly intimidating, but nonetheless were chained. Could it be that Bunyan is speaking here about the need to publicly testify of grace, but that such will always be attended with much resistance? His time in the House Beautiful was most profitable, but also important. Whether through discretion or prudence, piety or charity, their conversation was not only aimed at encouraging Christian, 
but also determining whether salvation was actually in his possession. His testimony is most sure and full. He goes into further details regarding his own family, the heartbreak and agony which attended his fleeing the city of his birth, which was the city of destruction. To strengthen the Christian, these three damsels show him many things. Here Bunyan reminds us that in the Bible we see not only all the acts and wonders of our Lord Jesus Christ, but also the great things of God, which he alone accomplishes through his people. Before Christian leaves and enters the Valley of Humiliation, they give him a glimpse of the delectable mountains of Emmanuel's land. This further strengthens Christian, reminding him and reminding us of a better country which is to come, a city without walls, whose builder and maker is God. Music